Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Bomberg and I'm a Professor of Environmental Politics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And today I want to talk to you about the politics of international climate negotiations. I'll start by highlighting the challenging global context in which these negotiations take place. I'll outline some of the key stakeholders and some dynamics. But then in the final section, I'll discuss how and why, even though there is no international or global government, international cooperation and agreements in climate are possible. So let's start with the uh, context. And it's a challenging context. We know that states of the world have a common interest in addressing climate change and its devastating effects. We also know that climate change can't be addressed by just one society or country acting alone. International cooperation is needed, but the international co context is particularly challenging. And the first challenge is this. It's this notion of state sovereignty. A dominant assumption in uh, international relations and in diplomatic statecraft has been that individual states are legally sovereign. That means they have the right to pursue their own conception of national interest without external interference. Now, in our modern interconnected world, this might seem outdated, but the claim of legal sovereignty remains and countries invoke it often, often, while resisting pressure from others claiming that other countries or in international institutions don't have the right to tell it what to do. And this role of sovereignty matters because states, although, again, they share a common interest in addressing climate change, they also have competing uh, interests and positions on climate change. And these differences are based on that country's maybe climate vulnerability, on its energy sources, on its level of economic development, uh, and, uh, and its uh, role in international uh, trade. So what this means is that different countries view the uh, causes and possible solutions for climate change uh, differently. And that doesn't make negotiations impossible, but it does make them a bit tricky. The second issue that I want to raise is that of justice. So the politics of most global environmental issues, including climate, have a crucial north-south dimension. And by that, I mean that they're shaped by the uneven and inequitable relations between industrialized nations of the north and developing countries located primarily in the global south. The developing world is or is likely to be the most adversely and immediately affected by climate change and its effects, extreme droughts, flooding, sea level rise, disappearance of their very land. Yet the northern countries are largely responsible historically for the level of emissions causing climate change. So this raises questions, basic questions of equity and justice. And these questions permeate all negotiations. Who should take primary, respon primary responsibility for climate change? Should it be those big polluters of the past or should it be the major polluters today? Or should it be some mix and who should decide? So put another way, we can't address climate change without addressing many other issues besides. And that makes negotiations particularly interlocking, intersecting and particularly complex. The third complication is just the plethora, the, the whole range of different stakeholders involved in climate negotiations. I've already outlined differences between states, but states are not the only actors in climate negotiations. They are the formal parties to the conference or to the conventions or to the summits. They're the formal uh, player signing those agreements, but there's a whole range of different interests who work either through those states or work independent of them. These might be economic firms, uh, including multinationals. It might be the climate movements and the climate groups themselves. Maybe you yourselves are uh, members of some of these climate movements pushing for uh, change. Uh, experts are also involved. We need their knowledge and advice. Um, experts and NGOs rely on the media. And the media itself has now become a prominent actor, shaping how we understand the problem and the possible uh, solutions discussed at negotiation. 
And finally, international institutions themselves, like the United Nations, play a role in shaping those negotiations. So there's lots of different interests. There's lots of different uh, demands. At the national level, we tend to rely on national governments to adjudicate across these demands, to redistribute resources if necessary. But there is no global government. There is no international government to adjudicate or compel states uh, to act in a certain way. So that's the context, and it is uh, daunting. But remember, some of these dynamics and actors can work towards international agreement as well. It's precisely the pressure from NGOs and movements that can provide states with the incentive they need to cooperate, even though it might not be in their immediate kind of short-term uh, interest, right? So that leads to my next uh, and last session section which is on how do we get agree agreement how does this how does this happen uh, and we know that these international agreements even without a government uh, international government they are uh, possible we have agreements we have treaties targets and some real genuine uh, action and this is instead these agreements are not created or imposed by some central government we uh, we see instead the development of different rules and practices and agreements that lead to some agreed outcome. And over time, these agreements and these practices on climate change or other kinds of environmental cooperation, they can foster further cooperation and they can help build uh, trust and they can even shape a state's norms or a state's uh, behavior. And international relations scholars use the word regimes to refer to this set of norms and practices and agreements that build trust and can shape state behavior. The cooperation that we see in climate and other areas tends to be based on a simple principle of reciprocity. That's how these things start. That's the idea of you help me and I'll help you. Not because I'm a nice guy, but because I see it's in my at least longer term self-interest to do so. Or at the very least, the principal says, I will do this if you agree to do it uh, as well. And slowly through this interaction, trust can be built between uh, states and that uh, allows them to ramp up their uh, cooperation uh, over time. And we see this dynamic in a whole host of different uh, agreements and they're usually codified or um they are made uh, legal and are put down on paper by some legal multilateral uh, agreement. It could be a treaty, it could be a convention, it could be a uh, protocol. So in all cases, the idea is to start modestly. So let's use climate as, as an example. So in 1992, the um, states at a summit in that year decided that they would set up something called a framework convention. That's a very modest agreement. That doesn't have, that doesn't impose binding obligations or targets. That just sets forth shared norms, uh, shared goals, what they would all like to uh, see happen um, eventually. But what happens in international negotiations when they work is that over time, that something non, um, not very ambitious a convention can develop into something that is more ambitious, that is more binding. So in the case of climate, for instance, what we saw is five years after the 1992 framework convention, we saw agreement on the Kyoto Protocol, which you might have heard of. And this was signed in 1997, and it was much more ambitious because it represented the first step of uh, setting targets for some states, not all states, but some states. And then these can develop over time. You might have read or heard about the climate um, uh, conference, which took place in 2015. And this was a breakthrough because it expanded significantly the number of states signing up to different targets and, and pledges. And what was interesting here is that, again, uh, it, it was these are not targets imposed from above, but rather these are targets or pledges that the countries themselves came up with and pledged to uh, achieve. 
uh, in November 2021 in Glasgow, the uh, summit or the conference of the party parties that is sometimes called a, a COP. It was held to confer further progress in some of these areas, and there was some progress on things like deforestation targets and on methane um, uh, agreements, but there was not much agreement in a really prickly area linked to justice, questions about who should pay and how much responsibility should different states take. That's yet to be resolved. We might expect that to be much more central at the 2022 to a uh, COP in November, which will be held in Egypt. And you can expect uh, more attention probably to these questions of uh, finance and uh, responsibility. So that gives you an idea of how, even though we don't have this government and we have all these challenging contextual variables like competing interests, how nonetheless some progress can take uh, place at the international level. But this progress is not steady, it's not inevitable, um, there's always kind of steps forward and steps back. And above all, you know what, this takes time. International negotiation takes time, this building up of trust and further cooperation takes time. And that's tricky when we come to climate change because we don't have a lot of time if we want to avoid the most devastating effects of climate change. So what this means is that even though you now know more about international negotiations, you can't think of international negotiations as the panacea, as the cure to this uh, problem. Uh, negotiations are one part of a much broader suite and range of activities that you want to keep your um, eye on. We need to look at... Um, other state action, not just at the international level, but maybe regionally or maybe even bilaterally. But we also need to look at other actors, subnational actors, cities, um, economic firms, NGOs, groups, civil society groups, and individuals themselves. And we are uh, we all need to take uh, action, and you need to keep an eye on this action if you want to both understand what's needed to really confront this crisis, but also not lose hope that we can indeed meet this crisis. Thank you very much.